precision. How responsive nanomaterials take medicine to the next level. Ada Almuteri, University of California, San Diego. I remember seeing the fall of the wall on TV. I'd just turned 12, so I didn't understand the implications at the time. But I could tell it was significant from my parents' reactions. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here in Germany, the bedrock of chemistry. Um, I'm a materials chemist, and um, my goal today is to convince you that materials matter, materials with improbable properties can allow us to bring down walls in medicine and in biology. I, I just have one word to say, just one word. Are you listening? Plastics. <laughs> Do you remember that line from The Graduate? I'm a plastics chemist. We often use things without thinking about them and how they came about. Uh, for example, take this laser in my hand. Um, it took several Nobel laureates to develop this laser. It started with Albert, Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein's uh, equations on stimulated emission. Alfred Kessler then told us that optical pumping can give us stimulated emission. And um, some scientists in Russia and the U.S. were able to write up theories on how you could build a laser. And finally, a gentleman in Malibu, California, built the very first laser. And he used rubies, the precious crystals, rubies, to do this. Without these precious materials, we couldn't have the laser, the very first laser. And we wouldn't enjoy the amazing and stunning array of uh, applications in technology and in medicine and in information technology that the laser gave us. So these scientists weren't motivated by these applications, and Chancellor Merkel was telling us yesterday at the reception that these discoveries often surprise us all. The impact of the discoveries surprise us all. They're very difficult to predict. And so I, uh, it, the most stunning thing, I think, about lasers is that for decades, they were referred to as a solution awaiting a problem. But that's one of my points today. It takes a very long time to see a new equation, a new discovery, a new material have its impact. So I'm interested in the formidable ability of um, light to control chemistry in space and in time. And we want to do that in biology that has had astounding, revolutionary impact on areas like neuroscience. And we want to take that into living systems. We're, to, to, in order to do this, um, we have, of course, this array that you have here of energies that we get from the sun. All have different properties. All have been used in different ways. We're interested in the area sandwiched between visible light, that's the light your eyes can see, and that's the type of light that gives us um, chemical reactions because it has enough energy to do chemistry. That's what photosynthesis is, which is critical to us. It gives us our food and our fuel. And infrared light, um, up here, infrared light has the amazing proper property to travel through bulk turbid media, excuse my technical language, to through tissue. It has that property. I'll give you an example. Uh, seeing is believing. So, uh, you know, you have here green light and red light. So it's not quite near infrared light, but it'll give you an example of what we mean by tissue transparency and the ability of light to travel through tissue. So this is a green laser. Um, here it is. And if I put my thumb in front of it, you can't see it anymore. And this is a red laser, so it's not quite near infrared, but if I put my thumb in, it, in there, can you see it? Okay, good. So we're interested in near infrared light, which is a little bit beyond that. Now, that's challenging because unlike visible light, it doesn't have quite enough energy to give us real significant chemical reactions. And unlike in a infrared light, it doesn't really do a good job of traveling inside. But um, 
Yet, we think it's very important and it's doable. So here's how we plan to do it. We're, we're using nanotechnology. Uh, I'm a plastics chemist, and we build these beautiful, exquisite plastic containers in the nano-size regime. And inside, we're able to entrap um, biologically important molecules that are able to do chemistry in biological systems. When we entrap them inside, we're able to turn off their chemistry, their ability to do chemistry. And then the design is to dismantle them on command with light. And when we dismantle them, they can now do their chemistry because they're released. Okay, so let me orient you to the nanoscale. The distance between my heart and um, and my fingertips is a meter. Your thumb is about a centimeter. The blood vessels in your body are about one millimeter. Uh, blood cells inside your blood vessels are a thousand times smaller than that, and these blood cells are a thousand times smaller, uh, larger than a nanoparticle. These are the nanoparticles we're talking about. They're plastic. So the challenge is, uh, or our vision, is to get these into, into uh, living systems, into human bodies, and where we and they can, you know, it can be subcutaneous or in blood vessels, permeate through tissue, and where we shine the light, we can control the activity of these biologically active molecules in space and in time in living systems. So this is our goal. It's challenging, as I mentioned. But that's okay. We've got ideas, and one of our ideas is to use a concept ubiquitous in nature. Always turn to nature for inspiration. So, in photosynthesis, for example, a small conformational change initiated by light can can、uh, reverberate and cause a chain reaction that escalates into a much larger event, kind of like how the wall came down. Starts at the beginning. So here's here's how it works with our plastics. These are designer plastics we make from scratch, from atoms and molecules. And when we shine light on the particle, the plastic that's entangled、uh, to make the particle、uh, reacts at just one point, but that causes a domino effect that escalates and chain reaction and breaks up the entire polymer, the plastic. And so, a portion of that nanoparticle is now compromised, and the encapsulated biologically active agent is allowed out. And that's how we achieve turn off and turn on of chemistry in living systems. So, we published on this a few years ago for the first time. What you're seeing in front of you are actual pictures of these nanoparticles before and after irradiation with this very low energy, benign light that can travel inside living systems. This was、um, highlighted in several media outlets,、uh, and、um, you know, one highlight for me is when the U.S. Congress actually this this was presented to the U.S. Congress as a、uh, breakthrough of、uh, 2012. Surprising to me that they would care, but、um, it was nice. Now, what are what are we using these for? What are they useful for? Right? That's I've been told that's what I'm here to talk about: the medical uses of these materials. So we started using them for ocular drug delivery. It turns out that if you have a back of the eye disease like AMD, age-related macular degeneration,、um, you have to be injected with、uh, with the drug, and it has it has to happen maybe once a week, once a month, or twice a month, depending on your condition.、Uh, that's one example. Uh, AMD. Now, what we do is we inject the nanoparticles with our surgeons, our eye surgeons, into the back of the eye, and they reside there for about a year. And any time you shine light, you release the therapeutic of interest. And we treat these eyes from age-related macular type degeneration、uh, much better than any other、um, therapy out there. So we have very promising results. Another application that we are exploring is having this as a drug depot for insulin delivery with light. So, say you've got the drug implanted, this, these nanoparticles, just like in the eye, and any time you have a meal, you、um, you take this laser beam here and you shine there and you release your insulin. No injection, no pump. Okay, but、um, I think that the applications, honestly, 
And biomedical research are going to be where the real impact is, because we can give tools to biologists to study biology and nature with ultimate control, precision. So, oops. What's the future? I have to talk about the future. This is what they told me when, I, when they invited me.、Um, I just have one word to say. Are you listening? Lanthanides. Lanthanides are also known popularly as rare earth metals, rare earth elements. They're not rare. They're abundant, more abundant than gold, cheaper than gold, hundreds of times cheaper than gold. And they have remarkable properties. These elements mystified、uh, chemists in the 19th century, and then fell out of favor、uh, with chemists in the 70s. They were dubbed as boring. There is there are chemistry books that say that their chemistry is boring. Not at all. They have remarkable optical properties. And one property that that we're very interested in is this amazing, improbable property of taking low energy light. The light that can enter into living systems, and convert that to high energy light. Okay, this process though is fragile and delicate, because these are photons climbing up the beautiful energy ladder of lanthanides to reach the top and come out as high energy light. And this process can be easily shaken, and the photons can drop off the ladder as heat. So what we've done is we've protected this process in nanoparticles. We've created a protective shell. So these are our beautiful lanthanide-based nanoparticles. And when、uh, on the left, yeah, the left is、um, unprotected, and the process of upconversion is disrupted by noise on the outside. But on the right, on the on the left side, <laughs> right, left, is the protected shell. That helps build up the upconversion of photons inside, and they're emitted as bright, high-energy、uh, light. We've done this.、Um, we've increased the efficiency orders of magnitude. It's a very exciting discovery in the lab, and we've used this, of course, to initiate chemistry in soft matter, soft matter in soft matter, to release drugs and diagnostics. But some. Tangent discovery, actually, from this、uh, came about that I think is extraordinarily exciting, and it's a testament to my point today that the inventors themselves are surprised by the applications of their work. So we dis- we discovered, because we were working so hard on maximizing the mechanism that gives us light and minimizing the mechanism that gives us heat, we figured out a way how to maximize also、uh, the heat of、uh, the heating of these elements. People are using. I'm using my lab, gold for its photothermal properties. Gold is much more expensive than lanthanides, so we did our first experiments where we take these materials, put them in water, and put them in a laser, and we were able to heat the water in seconds. And you see steam bubbling up. And then we take the same material. I told my graduate students to go out in the sunshine in San Diego, and to put this ice water in the sun. And see how quickly you can get it to boil, and it, within seconds it also boils. So we believe that this discovery will help shape the landscape in solar energy harvesting and solar desalination. So my message today is: bet on creating new material with new and improbable properties.、It、goes beyond what the inventor could have imagined. And、um, I want to thank, of course, the teams that are, and it'll help bring down walls、uh, in biology and in medicine and beyond. As as I've mentioned, we're exploring solar cell uh, uh, harvesting and solar desalination. I want to thank our teams. We、um, have a, a joint effort、uh, at CAX Saudi Arabia. We have a team there, and we have a team in UC San Diego working together for the work that you saw. And I would like to thank、uh, Berlin and congratulate. The fall, the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. I'd like to thank the Falling Walls、um, Foundation for giving me the opportunity to spread our science. And、um, thank you very much. This is a picture of Berlin from space, lights of Berlin. Thank you. <laughs>